Welcome everybody to Refiguring Techniques in Digital and Visual Research. It's wonderful to see so many people here today. Um, I want to start with the acknowledgement of country. Um, RMIT University acknowledges the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which the university stands. And RMIT University respectfully recognises the elders both past and present. And as I said, it's, it's really wonderful to see so many people here. We're really excited that this is our first symposium that reflects on um, digital and visual research and enables us to bring together um, the expertise that we, we kind of generated, not only at RMIT in the Digital Ethnography Research Centre, but also at Deakin University and the VCA here in Melbourne. Um, because this isn't just Dirk's event, this is something we've collaborated with, um, with um, Melinda. Hinkson, who's there, and James Oliver, who will be joining us later on today. Um, so it's fantastic to really bring together this kind of expertise that's developing across Melbourne and to be able to celebrate that, and also to be able to have everybody else who's come here to join us and to be able to help us to develop our discussions and our rethinking of what the digital and visual mean when we bring, to get, bring them together in research practice and in things that we can try to know or, or hope to know and think about through our research practice as well. Um, I'm just here to open the event. Um, next in moment is I want to introduce you to Bianca Valentine. Most of you have probably had some contact with Bianca or know Bianca's name by now. Bianca's amazing job of making this actually happen. You know, we're just the props, really. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Bianca's got something to... Bianca's going to go through some housekeeping and, and other general things with you before we actually kick off with the event itself. Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming today. Just a few little things and then I'll buzz off. Um, here's the password for the Wi-Fi, so if you have any problems just come and see me up at the back of the room and most RMIT people will be able to get in but some of you may not, being a weird Building 100 thing. Uh, we have toilets and coffee, good coffee, T-squares up that way, so you just go up the ramp or upstairs just here, and the toilets are here. What I would like to ask you though is, during the presentations, could I, could I get you to go through the back and then go all the way around, just so that we're not interrupting the speakers? I'm sure they're well seasoned and not going to stuff up, but you never know. Um, yeah. Um, in the afternoon we will have a little break, so don't freak out, it is kind of a busy day, but uh, we do have tea and coffee up the back as well, so help yourself, and there's also water, so feel free, and then we'll break for lunch at 12.30. Okay, have a great day, thanks. Okay, so I forgot to introduce myself, I'm Sarah Pink, and, um, but I did introduce the event. And um, so I'm going to be speaking first, and what I'm going to be talking about is up to a point by way of an introduction to the symposium, but it won't be an introduction to all of the, the, the work that's going to be um, presented here. But what I want to talk about is um, a little bit about why I think it's, I thought it's important for us to have an event called Refiguring Visual Digital Research Techniques. And also I want to raise a series of core questions that really reflect on the technologies, the possibilities, the emergence, and an ethics of responsibility. Um, because if we are at a pivotal moment, in terms of how we're starting to rethink theoretically, empirically and practically how we might engage with, in research in relation to technology, then I think there's a whole kind of range of other things that come into that discussion which we might want to talk about today and, and to push on a bit further. And the whole, well, for me also the whole point of the symposium is actually to really think about how we might collectively be refiguring the way we practice and think about research with digital and visual technologies and, and techniques. Okay, so why refiguring techniques? Um, what I'm interested in is, is thinking about how we might conceptualise techniques. And I'm not calling them methods today. Sometimes I, I call them methods. Um, I'm interested in techniques today because I'm interested in thinking about techniques and technologies. Um, but I think we need ways of conceptualising techniques within research. And I've put the important words in red in case anybody is in any doubt about what I think is important. Um, and, um, and I want to think about techniques within research and techniques as emergent within research and technologies as emergent within research as well, instead of thinking of methods as applied to research problems. Um, so I also want to think about research as process, 
and about te techniques and knowing as emergent from within research and from within research processes rather than being something that you get out of it and as, as separate. Um, I'm interested in the technique as performed and in conceptualising research as making. And there I'm thinking about making, again, as a process where we're pulling together and crafting in an ongoing way different things with different qualities and different affordances and actually pulling those together in such a way that new ways of knowing might emerge through the research process and, and, and that research process as being a performative event as well. And not all of that is necessarily particularly new. But one of the other aspects of it for me is, is the fourth point, which is the idea of digital materiality as being part of the world that we're actually conducting research in and practicing in and thinking in. And um, this year, at the beginning of the year, I published an edited book with my colleagues, Alessandra Ardevol and um, Deborah Lanzani, called Digital Materialities. And there we try to conceptualize the context of digital materiality, again, as being a world in which the digital and the material aren't really separate. We can't actually think of them being separate. And we see digital materiality there as something that's ongoingly emergent as part of the environment that we're inhabiting and that we're part of as well, rather than being a material world that has had the digital done to it or that the digital is impacting on. Trying to actually really look at the relationality between those two things that were maybe previously thought of as being separate and to then now situate research techniques and technologies as actually part of that context of ongoing and the emergent digital materiality. So what I want to do now though is to think about five questions. I also posted these five questions on Facebook this morning, really early this morning. Um, and it would be great if people want to respond to that online or on Twitter or on Facebook or on social media generally and, and just engage with that discussion further. Um, I think Bianca's given you all the hashtag already. So um, we really want this event to expand outside the room as well. So, and also to, to continue after this symposium as well. And we'll talk about that a bit later on at the end. But um, five questions. The first one is what does the technological possible mean for digital visual research? And I'll, I'll go through the questions in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, the second one is, what are the implications of seeing researcher engagement with new and emerging technologies as, as improvisation rather than innovation? And I'll talk about that distinction as well. What does this mean for an ethics of responsibility in digital visual research? How can we harness techniques that involve digital visual technologies for making or ensuring better futures? Finally, how can that help us to work with external research partners and stakeholders to gain understandings that will enable us and them to better judge how we move on into our digital futures? So that's also a wider agenda for what research might mean in a contemporary environment. So I'll go into these questions in a bit more detail in terms of what my thinking behind the questions is, but I'm not intending to answer the questions at all. What I'm more interested in is the question of generating discussion and maybe us never answering the questions, but for us developing thoughts around them. So what does the technological possible mean for digital visual research? Um, I'd be really struck by the way that the technological possible in the context of discussions of smart homes and smart cities, which is part of my work, um, tends within a technological design discourse often to assume that new technologies are going to have impacts on the world and they're going to make new things happen and make people live differently. But ethnographic research really consistently shows that actually people use technology, technology for things they're not designed for. And I won't bore people with my research about washing machines now in any detail, but um, people don't necessarily always use washing machines to wash their clothes with. Um, it also shows that digital innovations um, <coughs> that actually what people really do with technology is also falls outside the imagination of the designers. Um, I wrote a paper um, with my colleagues Vika Force and Martin Berg looking at life logging cameras and looking at the imagine how the designers of these cameras imagined what people would do with them and what people may really do with them. Um, oh. No, we're not going to do the updates. <laughs> Unless anybody's got half an hour. Um, but it also also has shown that everyday objects, um, people use people use technologies, use everyday objects to achieve objectives where design technologies fail. And 
I've done some work around how people use sticks. Um, and often, sticks, you don't really necessarily need a, an app when you've got a stick. You can really work, work towards environmental sustainability by using a stick um, to intervene in your, in your everyday life processes, um, to hang things up and switch things on and off. You don't really need someone to design an app for you to encourage you or, or make you to do that. So that kind of everyday improvisation is also really exciting. So, um, so when you start to, re to apply that then, um, not just to everyday life and how we investigate everyday life, but to research practice as well, we can, start, we can actually go beyond the idea that these new and emerging digital technologies make new visual research techniques possible. It's not that they make new research techniques possible or make us do research differently or enable us to do it. It's more than that. Um, what's mo much more interesting is to switch that around a bit and start thinking about, actually, the context of digital materiality in which the affordances of new digital visual technologies emerge. So what do we do with these new technologies when we start to use them within research? What do we make it possible for them to do with us and for us and with research participants? And how do new research processes or modified research processes actually play out through the relationships that we then develop with the new technologies that we might be using, that research participants might develop with them as well? So really, let's think about how um, technological possible then is actually a set of affordances that are always emergent from those particular configurations of projects and people and things. They're not something external that is done to research and that changes research in the way that we can do it. Oh, more updates. Oh, you can't see that, I can. No. <laughs> um, the second question then, what are the implications of seeing research engagement with new and emerging technologies as improvisation rather than innovation? Some people who've worked with me recently will know that I've become really interested in, the, in how an innovation as growth perspective or discourse um, offers oh, one kind of logic through which to think about technological change and how that logic actually works and functions in, in society and in ways that produce particular outcomes, particular ways of seeing the world. And what, from that perspective, we could see some of the technologies I know are going to be spoken about, say, like drones and Google glasses and 360-degree cameras. The argument there is that they expand our repertoire for digital visual research design and practice. Um, and these kinds of technological innovations as well could be said to invite new forms of mobility, new perspectives, new engagements, new types of sharing, collaboration, etc. And when you put that into a research funding context, an institutional environment where, yes, the innovation as growth perspective and the innovation narrative is really important, underpins why people might get money to do their research and get funding, then those arguments really can support researchers then who practice those environments. And they can also support researchers who claim they're going to have an impact in the world or on the world through their innovations that develop in their research. But um, there are two logics at play here. And I don't think those logics are necessarily separate because I think they work interdependently in the world that we live in. But there are also other discourses about innovation. So some scholars try to redefine innovation as being ongoing and embedded in everyday practice. Or the notion of social innovation is applied to actually thinking about innovation in a rather different way to the innovation as growth discourse. But actually what I like more often is um, Tim Ingold and Liz Hallam's argument that ongoing improvisation rather than finished innovation actually underpins creativity. So Ingold and Hallam critique the notion of innovation as an after-the-event definition. Innovation as a product, as an outcome, and improvisation as an ongoing processual um, concept. And here, if we apply this to techniques and technologies, we can argue that they are actually emergent within research processes. They're always incomplete. Um, and they're not already existing, so we don't have an in existing innovation in research or, or an innovative research technique that becomes applied to research, um, but actually always an improvisation that emerges within research process. So for the kind of work I do, which is ethnographic, this means that it's kind of improvisatory ways of doing research with technologies. They actually participate themselves in shifts in ethnographic research, but they become moulded as technologies within research as well by the research practice itself. So for that question, 
you know, what are the implications of actually thinking about research from that perspective rather than an innovation perspective? The third question really brings us to the question of ethics and ethics of responsibility in digital visual research. Now, I've heard um, that questions of ethics have been really kind of at the centre of some of the discussions that have already been happening this week, because this is the last in, in a series of events this week. And um, visual and digital research ethics, I think, have become a really massive area of discussion in recent years as well. Um, and for me, this is actually part of this whole question about the different types of logic in which we might do research and how those, type, those logics of research and practice and ethics are within the same context and they're attached to our institutional context, but they're also attached to our everyday and our own research ethics context as we actually engage within research processes. So I think for me, seeing research techniques as improvisatory rather than innovative, and also thinking about anthropologies of ethics, which show ethics as situated and ongoing, not ethics committee processes that you do to your research or that you use to regulate your research. They're not measurable, they're not anticipatory, they're not auditable. Um, those two logics are, are kind of shared. So we could put together the idea of research techniques as being emergent from process, research process, but also research ethics as being emergent from process as well. Um, and then if we think then of digital visual research technologies as also being shaped themselves within the research process in terms of our relationships with participants and the technologies and the environments we do our research in. Um, I think that's for me is where ethics of responsibility is located, actually within the research process. Where we actually collaborate with participants to determine how our co-produced materials are shared in the research process and how those materials actually emerge, how they're shaped what happens to them next and how they're related to the technologies that we're using. And there are other questions of how new technologies and techniques also facilitate research sharing in, in new ways. But that for me also takes us back to the context of digital materiality that, you know, my colleagues have also argued is emergent and processual, where um, we're actually learning these new technologies and techniques and producing them, making them within this context of the digital material, which is also part of our everyday lives and part of our academic environments. Yes, there are new ethical situations that are emerging with new technologies like GoPros and eye tracking, which again, I know are going to be spoken about later. But I don't know if they create new ethical dilemmas, because if we actually locate their use within this ethics of shared ethics of responsibility with participants, rather than you know, treating the researcher as patron who protects and takes ethical decisions on behalf of participants, then that for me is completely coherent with a research practice that um, I think has been part of a lot of anthropological work for a long time. So I'd love us to think about ethics during the day as well and to bring that back into the discussion that we'll have at the end. The fourth question then is how can we harness techniques that involve digital visual technologies for making or ensuring better futures? Should our research just be about understanding the present, reflecting on the past, or should our research actually be about working with participants and stakeholders in projects to move on into a different future? How can we do that? So again, I think these two discourses about improvisation and innovation come into here as this, this question as well, and they also come into the impact discourse. So there are two different ways of thinking about it. Are we imagining an existing world that our research could intervene in and change? Or are we actually thinking about how an inhabit, inhabit a world where we move forward into uncertain futures in positive and beneficial ways with participants? And that's one of the questions I've been working with Yoko Akama, who I've seen here somewhere in, in some of our projects together as well. Now, ethnography can't be a predictive science. I know we're going to talk about more than ethnography today, but that's the kind of basis of my own practice. It can't be a predictive science, but it does offer us ways to understand the contingencies of how life plays out through co-creating examples with participants. And that's, again, about that being in there in the research with participants. One of the things I think is really interesting about technology is that some of the talks we'll be about today, like eye tracking and GoPros, is that they actually take us to the edge of a previous future, <laughs> in that they can report cord up to that edge. But how do we then use those journeys up to a previous future that's actually kind of slipped over into the future that, that's now gone past? How do we imagine what might happen next? How do we interrogate those contingencies of what's already happened to think about how we might actually participate in what happens next? Or how do we engage our knowledge of how previous futures have already unfolded in the past to 
quite speculative and hopeful, and I think the idea of hopeful is really important, rather than predictive modes of intervention. So those are really hard questions, which I like people to, you know, we supply really good answers for at the end as well. And the final question is a bit long. I might have to stop to breathe in the middle, but how can digital visual technologies and techniques benefit collaborations with external partners and stakeholders to gain understandings that will enable us and them to better judge how we move on into our digital futures? So that's really similar to the last question, but I think there's some different points I wanted to make through that question. So one point for me is actually by acknowledging and engaging with the particularity of these everyday digital material environments and our experience of them. So, as researchers and scholars, can we actually bring in insights and thoughts about the, the environments we're living in now that enable research partners to think differently with us? Um, how do we actually use new techniques and technologies to go into the digital material worlds of participants of research with them and actually try to inhabit their near digital futures as they unfold with them? So for me, that's a way of thinking about digital futures that um, involves our engagement in people's worlds and imagining them with them as well as part of research. But importantly, as researchers and scholars, how do we create new dialogues with theoretical scholarship? with wider bodies of research, intervention, design and ethnographic practice or other forms of research practice. So a lot of the stuff I've talked about now is actually about research and research practice, but part of that is our theoretical scholarship. How do we actually push our research into new forms of theory and actually bring those theoretical ideas back into applied and public and interventional research processes in ways that are beneficial, not just for us in terms of our publications and our articles, etc., but also for research partners and stakeholders and participants. So that's another difficult question for us to collectively answer at the end. And finally, my summary, I'd start to call it hopes and aspirations rather than conclusions. But also because I actually like to, in most of my work, end in some way that's open rather than trying to close, close up. And it's also a bit of a call for thinking differently. So how do we divest our discussions of research techniques from discourses of innovation driven newness? and what processes might we want to do that, to actually do that in a way that has real impact on the way that research is done, not just by people who are open to that idea, but to also spread that idea a bit further. Um, I also want to argue towards the focus on how research techniques are ongoing and made, but also the instances and the, the leakages between forms of difference, and also how they're situated on the cusp of our steps into uncertain futures, and through acknowledging our states of not knowing. Um, and I'd like us to interrogate our starting assumptions then about the place of existing, imagined and emerging technologies and ethnographic practice. Because I think there's a lot of public discourse and also a lot of discourse in, in the research and scholarship exactly about what new technologies are for and what they can do and what they might be able to do. So how do we challenge that also by seeing them as part of our research practice rather than just the things that we do research about. But finally, I want to argue for acknowledging and seeking to comprehend the digital materiality of the worlds that we experience, research and intervene in. So those are my hopes for today. That's all I wanted to say. Um, I think we might have time for a couple of questions or comments. Ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So I actually did the 20 minutes. Yeah. Fantastic. Perfect. Perfectly timed. <laughs> <laughs> You can ask me questions, but there won't be any answers. Responses. <laughs> You're doing the answers. Yeah. You've got a question. I'll just get you to talk to the mic. Thanks, that was fantastic. Um, I just, I'm really struck by this idea of an ethics of hope. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit, um, perhaps personally, I know you don't like answers, that's fine. Um, this is going to be a difficult question. But, but how do you feel like you bring hope as a kind of ethos to the work that you do? Um, that is a hard question because I only thought of it this morning. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I was just finishing the presentation, but it actually just occurred to me that, that it is more of an ethics of hope and, and hope that... Um, research can actually 
enable us to move on and into different and, and positive futures in ways that are productive. Um, how do, I think the question for me is actually how do we do that? Um, and how might we, if we put hope at the centre, um, be, able to, be able to kind of focus our aspirations in, in an in a interesting and positive and useful way? So I think it's actually more of a question than me having a specific answer about it. But um, the word, and the term hope is actually, I think it, yeah, it, it comes up in, in various different, um, different things that I've looked at recently. Um, I think one of Manuel Castell's recent books was about had hope in, in the title or, or somewhere in it as well, and, and that was a book about activism, a recent book about activism. Um, so I think there is, I think it's at the core of what we might want to aspire to and, and to think about and to push forward somehow. You know, whether, how, how achievable it is and what it actually means in terms of a, a concrete end point is, is different, but yeah. Hi, Sarah. I'm um, sort of a related question, but I'm very interested in this, and it's a big question for our lab and many people I work with. So what do you see as a good way to map forward this ethics dilemma of the technology and then the, you used the word, shared responsibility mm -hmm. with, um, with people we might be involved with with the research? And, I mean, it's such an interesting question, and I know you <laughs> solutions, what is the solution? That's a hard thing, but what yeah. do you see as the best way to approach it? Yeah, um, no, it's, it is a, I think that's another aspiration, um, but um, I think for me, the core of the question is how can a responsibility for the things that we know and that we produce with other people, and I don't only mean with people who participate in our research, I also mean stakeholders in research and the whole range of, of different kinds of um, stakeholders and parties that might become involved in the research process. Because, and also, I guess for me, it also comes as part of a departure from traditional ways of doing anthropology, where really the only two people involved in the research process would be the, the researcher, her or himself, and the participant. And the kind of the co-ownership and co-creation of knowledge would be situated between those two people. But, but when you start working with other stakeholders and working across disciplines, people from other disciplines, people from other organisations, then there's a much wider potential pool of people who might be interested in research. So how do you actually bring together those groups of different stakeholders into a context where you share the production of knowledge, you share the questions about what you might want to know, and you share the questions of what you might do with that knowledge? Um, I think an analogy to it is um, stuff we've been talking about in our data ethnographies workshops as well, um, here that Dirk has been leading on, because um, there, I think interesting questions there are about how, how do we actually deal with responsibility for producing data, for sharing data, for organisational uses of data, for the analysis of data. So it's, it's a wider question. It's, it's not just about research ethics. It's also a wider question about being in society where sharing different types of knowledge and information and, and co-creation are becoming increasingly possible in, in new ways. Yeah, I think you're right. Like, um, the relationships gone moving from one to one or one to few. Mm -hmm. The very nature of a digital technology, it now goes one to a very great number of people. And that's a really interesting question. And yeah. It needs to be addressed a lot more. Mm. Can we get you? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. <laughs> the question. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about reconciling that sort of permanent state of not knowing this yeah. or, um, with the relationships with industry and with external partners that you mm -hmm. alluded to, because yeah. they, you know, those can pull against each other. You know, that, yeah. that sort of, you, you, you know, a sort of a uh, not exactly a reluctance, but a but a, but a resistance to the to the, to the notion of fixing knowledge in particular. Yes. Can pull against what mm. external partners might want to and do. It's, I guess it's not just about external partners, it's also about writing funding applications as well, because you know, so much research is outcome focused. Um, 
and, and that's where knowledge starts to sometimes become static as well. But I also wouldn't necessarily underestimate the way that external research partners might think as well. Um, simply because I think as we're moving into a really interesting new digital economy where um, it becomes really evident that um, the kind of the context that we're working in is, is emerging and changing very quickly. I think there's also a sense that we, we need to kind of start thinking around um, an environment that's ongoingly changing, not just for us as academics, but also in a wider society as well. So, um, but, but yes, and one of the, actually one of the slides that I didn't show, but um, is in the wider writing I've done about this, was also the, relates to that question of stopping knowledge and making it actually stand still so that it can be used in some way. And, and that's something that's very hard to escape in, in any area as an academic as well, but it also relates to the question of research techniques because once we start talking about research techniques and technologies, and we'll do this today, we'll actually end up by suspending them and kind of hanging them up there. And I'm, one of the dangers by, of doing that is actually then starting to think about them as things that you can take off a peg and apply to a project. And the argument that I've been trying to make throughout is that we can't really, we shouldn't be thinking about working with methods or techniques like that because if we consider them to always be part of practice and as emergent within practice. In that sense, they're not things that we can objectify and then pass on for someone else to use because they re-emerge and become reshaped in every context. Now, I've written about um, how some of my video methods have worked like that and that they're not... You, you always end up writing about them, but it's never meant to be a, a manual. It's never meant to be a, a template for how to do research or something that somebody else can use as it is, as it is in research. And, and all my writing about uh, methods or methodology, I always try to end the book or write somewhere in, in the book that everything I've written about is not something that other people... I'm not recommending people do it or copy it. It's actually meant to enable people to think differently or to think about how they might develop something else. So nearly, and that's the way I see knowledge. And if we, when we do state it, when we do put it down, it's it's really meant to be stuff that other people can use to think about something else with, not necessarily think about what I've written about with. And for me, that's quite a nice way to kind of think about also about how we contribute as academics and how we write and how we, we make things in our work. Well, thanks a lot, Sarah. I I sort of really like the way you're talking about drawing on speculative philosophies, mm -hmm. and I was just wanting to find out how you thought about responsibility because then it, in that, mm. from that point of view, responsibility is not something that's assumed or intentional. It's something mm -hmm. that unfolds in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I just wanted you to talk a little more about how, how you sort of theorize or talk about responsibility in the situation. Yeah, um, I don't know if I actually thought about or theorized responsibility that explicitly. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, one of the reasons why I, I started to use the term hope at the end of the presentation. Um, kind of, it was because I started off by talking about an ethics responsibility and I ended by talking about an ethics of hope. And um, for me, I think the ethics of responsibility is, is really what I was actually responding to Adrian's question about as well, about thinking about how can different types or groups of people actually be responsible to and with each other within a research process where conventionally we haven't necessarily thought about those relationships of responsibility. So how if you're doing a research project that involves research participants, you might be working with a company or a business or another organisation, you might also be working with another type of organisation with a university who's regulating your ethics. Um, how, when you, and, and the researcher her or himself and also our communities of researchers who we talk to how can you actually create shared forms of responsibility where, where we are thinking of ourselves as being responsible to each other but, and, and the complexities of that because that involves different groups of people being responsible to other groups of people who they might actually think of as having different sets of values. So maybe it's about creating share, shared senses of values and responsibility together. I mean, that would be hard, um, but probably not, not impossible. Yeah. So we're finished.